Hi, and welcome to our inaugural Queer Institute for Liberal Values panel discussion. So let me tell you a little bit about what we have in mind with QILV. QILV is this partnership between ILV and Queer Majority. And we've got the editor and founder of Queer Majority, Rio Veradonair, here with us. He is going to be the one moderating this conversation. But one of the things I wanted, you know, when we start these ILV kind of sub chapters, if you will, a lot of people ask, well, you know, like with Black, the Black Institute of Liberal Values, you know, liberal values doesn't have a gender, it doesn't have a sex, it doesn't have a, a, a color. But what we wanted to do is because liberal values is for everyone, not everyone is aware of that. And so we wanted to bring this idea of liberal values to various communities so that eventually we all kind of come together under the banner of liberal values. So with that said, that is part of our conversation today. Our conversation is on queer liberalism. What is it? How do people you know, see that? Where have we maybe been illiberal in the way we think about LGBTQ issues? And I'm very excited today. We've got an amazing panel. So we've got Rio, as I already mentioned, lead of Queer Majority. And we have a couple other great guests. We have Ben Appel, who is his book, Cis White Gay, was about his experience in the LGBTQ activism and Ivy League academia, which is forthcoming. Jimmy is a psychotherapist who grew up in traditional Pashtun family in the UK, and you're a spokesperson for the Council of Ex-Muslims of Britain. Phil is the author of Auto-Heterosexual, Attracted to Being the Other Sex, a book about sexual orientation behind the most common type of transgenderism. I am standing in for Dr. Iona Italia. I hope I can do her justice. And we are expecting Will Riley to uh, join us soon as well. So before we get started, just a few housekeeping issues. For those of you who are watching who aren't a part of Circle, we invite you to join Circle. It's not spammy, it's just our community and that allows you to actually be a part of these live streams and ask questions. If you're not a part of Circle, these will be put on our YouTube, IL Values YouTube later in the, uh, probably later next week. So also for those who are here, there's a little chat box. Feel free to start to ask questions as they come up and I will help to moderate that. So with all that said, thank you all for joining us today. And Rio, I turn this over to you. Thanks, Jen. Um, and uh, as I just said backstage in the green room, virtual green room, uh, feel free to weigh in on the, the subject of liberal values and, and uh, the broad struggles that we all face as, as actual real liberals in this current environment where there's a backlash against our values on both sides of the political spectrum. Um, I'd like to kick the conversation off just by saying a little bit about Queer Majority. Um, for those of you who aren't familiar with it yet or who maybe have read some of our articles but haven't read our about page, uh, we founded QM because we wanted to stand up for the majority of people who support LGBT rights in the West, but who are alienated by a lot of the extremism that's being pushed in our name, and which is causing a backlash against our rights. So when um, Jen asked me to put together a panel of uh, QM contributors to talk about this issue, uh, I immediately knew why she reached out to me and why, why a partnership with uh, the Institute for Liberal Values made perfect sense. We've also partnered with Counterweight, which was the foundation Helen Pleckrose um, founded uh, and which uh, um, ha handed on all of, all of their resources to ILV. So um, I'm, I'm really excited to, to be here. So th thanks for inviting us all, Jen. All right, so um, I guess I'll start by asking each of you some personal questions about your own backgrounds. But this way you can tell yourself, you can introduce yourselves uh, to the viewers a bit more, but then also uh, kind of give them a sense of why your experience relates to this broader question. So um, I'll start off with Ben. <clears throat> ben, you've written two articles for Queer Majority, and they both have great titles. Uh, one of them was Victimhood is One Hell of a Drug. And you talk about the kind of obsession with victimhood culture and how people just wallow in their victimhood instead of getting getting you know getting over it and 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 learning to grow and, and improve from it and how that actually is toxic and holds people back. And the other one is uh, perhaps even more um, uh, heretic in our circles: the redemonization of the gay male, which relates uh, directly to your 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 uh, your book. Uh, Cis, cis, cis gay male. Cis gay men. Is that is that what it's called? Cis, cis white gay. 
Is white gay even better? Yeah, I haven't read it yet. Is it? It's um, it's, it's not it's out in yet. production still. It's That's in what I thought. Okay. <laughs> yeah. So tell us a bit about your experience with victimhood, and then if you would segue into the the what you mean by the redemonization of the of the gay male. Yeah, that's a good question. I mean, with for the victimhood piece, it was the first piece I wrote for you. And it was really about, you know, I w attended Columbia University in my 30s. So I had lived quite a bit of life and I was there as an undergraduate student. And, you know, I had worked in some LGBT activism, volunteering for marriage equality campaign in Maryland and, and then a transgender rights le uh, legislation campaign. Um, you know, just a little bit, you know, uh, volunteering for those things. Um, when I came to Columbia and when I kind of entered the the activist space in New York, where there were a lot of younger people involved and I was around this young queer culture, um, I was really surprised by how geared up everyone was to to be victims and how kind of survival and overcoming hardship was, uh, you know, not necessarily taboo, but it wasn't something that was really uh, promoted. And, and for me personally, having come from a place where I grew up in religious fundamentalism, I spent a lot of time, you know, I battled drug and alcohol addiction. I spent time, a lot of time in psych wards. I had severe mental health issues in my late teens and early twenties, you know, coming through all of that, getting sober, overcoming, building a life for myself and, you know, being a part, a contributing part of liberal society and feeling like that was something that I needed to do to survive you know, if I wanted to live and make it through that. And I found that there was so much incentive to, to do the opposite, that everybody was really being incentivized to be victims and to, and to be um, incapable. You know, suddenly people were putting, you know, their obscure, you know, mental health and their physical, you know, disabilities in their, their bios and their social media handles. And everybody was talking about, you know, all of these different, you know, ways in which they were, um, you know, disabled and incapable of, of success. Um, you know, Jack Halberstam is a queer, th you know, theorist, a professor at Columbia who wrote the book, you know, the queer art of failure, you know, which kind of like promotes, um, failure for queer people and how let's leave success to those right wingers. Let's leave success to those normies. Um, and let's kind of, and it just seems so counterintuitive and counterproductive to me. And it was, it was sad. And I found that, uh, you know, for me, that wasn't the, the solution. And so, um, I found myself on the outs because I wasn't wallowing in victimhood. And then, you know, with the cis, gay with the re-demonization of the of the gay male what what that kind of what i was shocked to see was is that when i went into these spaces i wasn't the right kind of gay i wasn't the right kind of queer you know i had essentially assimilated into liberal cult so i had you know married my husband you know i had i was i was uh not doing my part to to raise Western civilization and kind of con construct a socialist utopia. I was an, a fascist, you know, bootlicker, um, assimilationist gay, a cis white gay, which was just a common, um, you know, colloquialism that was just thrown out. Um, and I was referred to this kind of in the same cadence, in the same way that the kids in middle school used to call me fag. It was like carrying that same kind of venom and that vitriol. And I was kind of stunned by that and a little shocked by it, um, especially coming from people that weren't, in my opinion, necessarily LGB or even T, um, but were kind of politically identifying into a community, again, for cultural cachet, for victimhood cachet, you know, that kind of inverted, hierarchy that, you know, intersectionalism, while, intersectionality, while it can be really helpful, a lens to look at, you know, discrimination and social justice issues through when it's the domineering lens and it kind of creates this inverse hierarchy where everybody's grasping to be, uh, you know, the kind of 
most marginalized um, to be really the most immune to criticism and, uh, and to kind of have the most illiberal power. Um, not everyone, but that it has created that opportunity and um, we're human. And I think that people are just going to naturally respond to it in that way. So that was kind of the experience there. Yeah, I think I think a liberal approach to intersectionality could be, you know, basically just recognizing that we're all individuals and we all, uh, you know, ha are, are maybe um, have privilege in some ways and are disadvantaged in other ways. That is something that most people understand intuitively. And I, I think that most honest liberals would have to recognize that in the West, we've done such a good job overcoming so many of those roadblocks based on sex and race and sexuality and so forth that it, that, uh, you know, not that there, there isn't more work to be done, of course, but really what we ought to be doing is helping people in parts of the world where they're actually still really oppressed, where there's still a real cis heteropatriarchy, so to speak. And I feel like that's a good way to segue into uh, Jimmy Bangash, because <laughs> the, the piece you wrote for us, Jimmy, was called uh, How um, uh, Islamic Homophobia is Empowered by Leftist Silence. Can you tell us what you meant by that? Yeah, I think maybe liberal silence would probably be a, a more um, appropriate title, actually. But it's been published now and it's a bit too late in the day to go back, right? So um, it essentially it is, so as a spokesperson for the Council of Ex-Muslims of Britain, a lot of what I do is kind of um, challenge uh, Islam and some of the uh, Islamist beliefs that are quite disempowering to different groups of people. Uh, within Islamic communities. So, for example, with women or with people from LGBT um, heritage. So, what we tend to find actually is that whenever you uh, want to go forward and say, actually, this religion is oppressive to the rights of women, or this religion is oppressive to, towards gay people, or it's oppressive towards people who want to leave the religion to apostates what you would expect is for liberal voices to kind of jump up and maybe media on the left to platform you and give you a voice and say, actually, here are some genuine concerns around very real human rights abuses. Um, and if we tie this into uh, the United Nations Declaration of Human Rights, we can see very distinct and clear contraventions towards uh, people's human rights. And what we found over the last few, last few years is that every try, every time you try and speak up, maybe about specifically Islamic homophobia, which is kind of what the article was really about, um, that we're constantly labelled as either racists or far right or as um, Islamophobes, and that is a really difficult place to kind of be because nobody actually wants to align themselves to a racist or a far-right bigot or an Islamophobe. And so all of a sudden you find yourself in this really weird space where the people that you were expecting to rally behind you and take up your call uh, for the human rights of gay people in Chechnya, for example, um, actually abandon you. And not only do they abandon you, but sometimes turn on you and uh, either try to silence you or condemn you as something that you're not. And, you know, the irony is just, is, is just pretty insane, like that you will have um, white people calling you a racist for talking about the homophobia in your own community, yeah? And there's this kind of conflation that always happens with the word Islamophobia. It's a word I really detest, I'm not a fan of it. What it deliberately, I would suggest, does is it conflates the religion of Islam uh, with Muslim people. And actually, you know, ideas are not beyond criticism. They need to be scrutinized and criticized and developed. But people, Muslims, you know, should not be uh, condemned or uh, marginalized or, or, or treated uh, inequitably within society. But by using this term Islamophobia, what we do is we conflate these two things together. And then because it becomes around Muslims, it's easier to accuse people of being racist when really what you're saying is actually in a number of, um, well, exclusively in Muslim majority countries, the death sentence is uh, available for gay people. I think there might be an amendment to that now. I can't remember one Christian country, their religious right just seems to have um, implemented something similar. It might have been Uganda, but up to uh, a year ago, 
it was exclusively Muslim majority countries that had the death sentence for being gay. In addition to that, it's exclusively Muslim majority countries uh, which have the death sentence for leaving the Islamic faith. So these are, you know, as you said, real like human rights abuses that are life and death situations. And when we try and draw attention to them, it is unhelpful and a complete disorientation from the word liberal to label people who raise these concerns as far right, bigoted, Islamophobe, racists. Uh, and is, you know, I think less shocking now, but at the time when I kind of first underwent this activism work, it was just, I was just dumbfounded. It was absolutely insane. And there's a complete absence of nuance in it as well. And this is a very nuanced area. So I think the screaming to shut you down from voices that we would see on the left or we would generally consider to be liberals, it, it often comes from a really good place. Like the motivation of it is that Muslims are a minority in Western liberal democracies and actually by painting them as gay killing barbarians, what you're gonna do is generate hatred towards them and that will lead to violence. So I can really get that that comes from a good place. But what that means is that we need to be even more clear in our language. We need to distinguish between anti-Muslim hate and legitimate Islamic criticism. And the word Islamophobia doesn't allow to, us to do that. Mm -hmm. So when we're talking about anti-Muslim hate or anti-Muslim bigotry, we should really be quite clear about that's what we're talking about. When we're criticizing Islam uh, or an Islamist movement, you know, that's what we need to be clear that we're doing. I'm kind of taken back to this event that I cannot, for the life of me, believe I attended. So there was this, um, this group called Inclusive Mosque Initiative. And during uh, Eid, they held a um, sort of an Eid celebration, yeah? And because of the name, Inclusive Mosque Initiative, we were like, oh, they'll be fine with ex-Muslims going there as well, because, you know, culturally, some of us still kind of partake in, in, in many of the religious uh, ceremonies. And I remember when we attended the event, there was like a female Iman, which, you know, many Muslims would see as blasphemous and theologically in Islam is kind of unheard of. And she opened her speech or, or her, 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 her welcoming to the room full of people. And, and one of the first things that she said was, if you're, uh, if you're a cis white male, is that right, cis? It's a, it's a whole new language, guys. So you, know, you, have to, you have to forgive me as I try to. If yeah, you, 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 you got it right. Although you're not, you're not white, though, right? You're cis. No, 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 I'm not. <laughs> and I actually, <laughs> you're, you're right. I'm not. But what is really pernicious is that 15 years ago, I wouldn't have even been aware of the fact that I'm the, I'm, I'm non-white on this panel, right? But now, because of the way the the lexicon has gone, as soon as we joined the call, I was like, oh my gosh, I'm the only non-white person here, and that wouldn't have even occurred to me before. It wouldn't have been a thing. But we went to this event, and at the event, the, the lady opened the talk with, if you're a cis white male, white male, please be, she didn't use the word mindful, conscious of uh, your privilege and how much space you're taking up here. Yeah. I don't even know what that means, right? Like, I really don't even know what that means. And then uh, a lady came up to do the kutbah, which is kind of the um, talk, you know, and, and it was like this anti-capitalism talk about how we're all oppressed by capitalism, et cetera. Absolutely fine, you know, if, you, if, that's, if you want to talk about a religious uh, event, you want to talk about non-materialism, I'd say that's quite a traditional thing to kind of talk about. But she mentioned white males probably about five times. And, and as ex-Muslims, we're kind of hyper-vigilant to this, like in some ways, because we don't really subscribe to this ideology of the evil white man quite often, yeah? Some of us do, many of us don't. And we went to sit down with them and kind of talk about, like, you, your inclusive mosque initiative, and you open up with, <laughs> with pointing out one group of people and essentially demonizing them that doesn't feel particularly inclusive. Um, actually, it feels quite excluding. And then, in addition to that, you know, I was pointing out the irony that actually this Eid celebration that you're holding really for LGBT people uh, and others, you are holding it in the basement of a hotel. 
And the reason that you're holding it in the basement of a hotel is because if you try to hold this event in a mosque, the violence and intimidation and threats that you would be met with would be debilitating, yeah? And we'd actually all be really scared for our safety if we were there. And the threats that we'd be met with would not be coming from Swiss white men, they'd be coming from brown Muslim men. And when the violence becomes enacted, when it crushes that threshold into people throwing punches or trying to lynch people or trying to attack people, we'd be jumping on our mobile phones to call the police and it would be cis white policemen who were coming to intervene and stop the brown uh, Muslim men from attacking us. So this idea that we need to be conscious or remind these white people about the space that they're taking up, actually what's more pertinent is here is the space that us of LGBT of Muslim heritage are not allowed to take up. You know, that's where your attention should be brought to, mm -hmm. that we're hiding in a basement in a hotel that you're not even able to list publicly where you're holding this event. We have to kind of email you to find out because we're all worried about security. And even when we're here, we're, you know, are we safe or are we not safe? So there's become this complete sort of disorientation about what is important. And, and when you mentioned about identity politics and how we might use it, you know, I think a more useful use of identity politics would be to look for collaboration. You know, so if, if I think, for example, about my experience of shame as a gay man within a Muslim community, you know, the way that uh, when I refused to be ashamed after several years of kind of coming to terms with my sexuality, being told that I should be executed because uh, that's what we do for gay people is a compassionate act so that they're not alive committing much more sin than they would do. And then the discourse, the scholastic discourse about how to kill your gay, like, should you decapitate him? Should you hang him like they do in Iran? Should we stone them to death like they do in Afghanistan? You know, like that, that sort of discourse breeds so much shame and internalized homophobia within you. And then when you manage to get to a place, a place where you have to some extent unraveled that and are able to stand forth and say, you know what, this is nonsense. It's not for me. And actually, this religion isn't even true. It's just some superstition somebody has made up and we've all subscribed. I unsubscribe, right? Then honor culture dictates because we're South Asian or, or many of these cultures have like a, a, an honor culture basis. You know, then what happens is the community moves on to your family. So they are then persecuted because you didn't even commit your sins quietly. Your son was out there committing his sins publicly, talking about being a proud gay man. And so then your family get vilified and persecuted. They get ostracized in the same way that you got vilified and persecuted and ostracized. And when, when we look at that, the shaming of the family, the shaming of us as individuals, you know, and I think about it from an identity politics perspective, when I look across that very desolate terrain of isolation that you're cast into, it's like, who's here with me? And as I look out, I can see actually there's many Muslim women stood on this exact same terrain of shame with me. Because if they try to date outside of, uh, if they try to date, for example, or have sex before marriage, or lead a life where they don't want to get married and they want to be independent, they too are victims of exactly the same mechanisms of honor culture. They also are ensnared in the insane web of shame. And I think if we use identity politics in this way, like where we use it to kind of collaborate and point out commonalities, rather than ever decreasing, you know, to smaller groups who are then in opposition with each other or some kind of hierarchical Olympics of oppression, it's a much better use of our time. Wow, that was that was great. Um, I was going to do Phil next, but Will joined just in time, and uh, you set us up for introducing Will so perfectly there. As Will was listening, I'm sure you can imagine where I'm going to ask you to go go <laughs> based on your body of work. I'm almost done reading Will's latest book, uh, Lies My Liberal Teacher Told Me, which is terrific and is uh, for sale all over the place, including Barnes & Noble, I understand. Um, Jen, could you uh, quickly introduce Will for us since he was a tad late? <clears throat> hey, Will, it's good to see you. So yes, of course I can introduce Will. Will is the Associate Professor of Political Science at Kentucky State University, author of the book that you just mentioned, Rio, and also Taboo, 10 Facts You Can't Talk About, I Hate Crime Hoax as well. And you are currently sketching out a book looking at the transgender, gender fluid, and other kin. I don't know, 
I'm not sure what that means. Other can communities and the idea of flexible identity. So maybe we'll get to hear a bit more about that. Yeah, so so Will's only written one piece for us so far. I'm constantly hounding him to do more, but he's so busy and he's used to getting paid a lot more than my little nonprofit can pay him, I'm sure. But the piece he wrote for us was called Fucking is Good, Actually, An Unexpected Defense of the Sexual Revolution, by which I think he means um, unexpected coming from a um, an outspoken conservative like himself. But yeah, Will, um, you, you want to riff a bit on, on some of what Jimmy just said about the oppression Olympics and, and how uh, well-meaning white people talk over brown people, but actually pretend to be standing up for them and all that fun stuff? Because, you know, that happens, that happens to us as LGBT people as well. Ben mentioned that straight, straight folks saying, um, preaching to us about gay rights, and <laughs> it's, quite, it's quite remarkable. Oh, I think you're muted, Will. You have to click the little mute button. I mean, so first of all, an other Ken, for those of you that don't already know, is someone that thinks they're a non-human creature. So if you Google other Ken or just look it up online, there's a community of it's about 1.2 million people in the United States. And I have done some pretty deep research with them. I don't like have two furry suits at home yet or anything. But I mean, there are people that believe that their core identity is something like an elf or um, an alien. There's a woman named Lupa who's like in both, just like right? positive and BDSM communities, but who thinks she's a wolf. <laughs> And we'll talk to you about what it means to have a wolf spirit. Like, how does that affect everything from your taste in meat to your preference in sexual positions? Like, and we'll have serious conversations about this and it's written essays as Lupa. So the idea is if you can be, um, like one of them I think is called a real bad bitch, the animal inside, you can like find these online. I'm not making this up at all. So the, the basic question is if you can say as a, and the title may be a bit off there, but getting to the point, if you can say as an adult biological male that you are in every relevant way an adult biological female, why can't you say that you're a member of another predator species? And I mean, that's, that's basically the question. And I think this may or may not be a book that ever gets published. It may be part of a book that I'm thinking about writing about why human beings seem to have suddenly run into trouble with mating. Like just a lot of the trends in society right now kind of indicate this. So among upper middle class Westerners, the birth rate is uh, 0 0.7 children per couple. Uh, average age of marriage for men right now is 32, for women is 29. I don't want to get into a bizarre zone with this, but peak human fertility is 23. And this is as true for men as for women, by the way. It's actually a little more true. So what are we what are we doing that's moving us away from the basic ability to get married or to fuck, to quote the title of, of my last article? You know, 45% of men, I'm going to put a lot of blame uh, for this on the guys. 45% of men say they've never really approached a woman. They've talked to people on dating apps. This, this went wildly viral on social media yesterday after a major paper drop. They've talked to people on dating apps, but they've never in a bar or church or something like that just walked up to sort of a female equal and then asked for a number or a dance. So this strikes me as a weird panda bear-like thing that's going on with young people in society. They literally have to be pushed toward each other and taught how to interact. So I, I think the idea of people kind of breaking that pattern of horrible shyness, the post Me Too stuff, uh, the men's rights, some of the more extreme later waves of feminism, I think people may be breaking that pattern by saying, well, you know, I'm going beyond these human limits. I am, you know, this other thing. But anyway, all of that may be part of my next book. And none of that has anything to do with the actual points I've been asked to make here. But uh, I think the next book may not be focused on politics from a Republican or a dim lens. It's worth noting that I'm conservative when it comes to crime, when it comes to sex or the legalization of cocaine or something. I don't really have a political perspective on that. And I think that the the idea that everything is politicized is relatively recent. I mean, uh, most political figures, Bill Clinton or Donald Trump, were relatively hard to classify in partisan terms until pretty recently. I mean, Donald Trump is a New York City businessman who's very obviously pro-choice. So the idea that he is a rock-ribbed Republican and that the uh, the Christian right has no choice but to support him is entertaining, to say the least. 
I have a few very Christian Kentucky friends. I still play basketball and I hunt. And, you know, listening to them boys say, you know, well, Trump, obviously, yes, I believe he goes to church. I believe he loves the Lord Jesus. I like these guys as good Americans, but it, there's a lot of rationalization that's required to believe that. Almost as much as would re be required to believe that Trump is a devout Shiite Muslim, in my opinion. So, you know, it's, uh, it, come on. Anyway, so I guess second point would be, Polit there are issues that fall into the domain of the political and that have in every society, the Han dynasty, the Abbasid Caliphate, the Roman Empire, crime, immigration and border policy, the building of roads. And when it comes to those, I'm a traditional conservative businessman. There are other issues like what married couples do in their house or who can be married that often have not. And I tend to be very libertarian on those. And I would say that in the right, there's a major split between kind of the libertarian stake in a cigar wing and the sort of, and I like this guy in person, I'm not criticizing him, but the more Matt Walsh, you know, we need to bring the church house into politics wing. And that's something that's going to have to be resolved for any kind of long-term right-wing unity to occur. We often think this about the Democrats, um, and that's going to be my next point. The same problem exists on the right. But when you talk about, when the last speaker, uh, Jimmy, made the point about the these people are criticizing, it's sort of criticizing people who criticize Islam, when in fact Islam is one of the major forces, at least at the extremes, that attacks LGBT communities. I think that what you're dealing with here, and this is something I can speak on as an expert, as opposed to just sort of banteringly, what you're dealing with here is a clash between theory and objective reality. And I see this in pretty much every data set that I put together. And I, I think this is very important. So the theory is that the group that's oppressing minorities is kind of the external force that the left-wing theorist is warning against. And this is, this is all, to me, kind of down road from Marxism. It's the currently dominant group in society. So to the vulgar Marxist, it's the rich. To the critical race theorist, it must be white. To the fourth waiver, it must be men, so on. And in reality, life is pretty complicated so the group of people that is actually behaving in the most obnoxious way and committing the most violent acts very often is not the group that critical theory predicts that it would be. In fact, it almost never is because critical theory is basically wrong. It makes some good points about past sexism and so on, but at root, it's basically wrong. So, I mean, trans activists are far more violent and hostile than quote unquote TERFs to the extent that large marches of women basically just trying to talk have been attacked by mixed groups of males and females beating people and throwing pots of tomato juice and so on, disgusting images. I mean, people like beaten to the ground with soup all over their faces. Um, and you see this all over the place. I mean, black activists for 10 years made a national storyline out of the idea that police violence against black Americans was at nearly genocidal levels. But beyond that, that white crime against black people was out of control. I mean, recall that George Zimmerman was was not a police officer. The idea was that these vigilantes were hunting black people down in the streets to some extent. This is a pervasively white supremacist country. We are not safe. Uh, when I and other people, uh, Heather McDonald did an even better job of this, or Ralph Mangel from the Manhattan Institute, when Competent Quant started just looking at this, Roland Fryer, probably the, the OG in this field, uh, it actually turned out that first, interracial crime is extraordinarily rare. Um, the panic from everyone watching MSNBC and Fox was totally unfounded. The person most likely to kill you is in, in order, one, your husband, two, your wife, three, your ex-wife. Um, but, and there, there's actually a difference in behavior there between men and women. I mean, it, your current husband is very likely sort of silly brutishness. Your ex-wife is actually also quite likely. There's more capacity for long lingering hatreds than that side of the gender divide, perhaps. But, um, a group of the warriors from the other race, there's, there's zero, no chance at all. Um, so interracial crime, if you actually look at what's called the BJS in CBS, the uh, annual actual national crime report, there are about 20 million uh, violent crimes and most serious property crimes in, in a year. That's a rough figure. Uh, of those, about 600,000 are going to be felony uh, classic interracial crimes, a black perp and a white victim, 
or white perp and a black victim, uh, that's about 3% to 3.5% every year. So a minuscule figure. Um, that's just worth noting. But of that minuscule chunk that no one should really be obsessing about, 80 to 90% of the crimes in every year that I studied were uh, black on white rather than white on black. So there was, not only is there not much reason to, to dwell on this, there's no reason to dwell on this from the black side with the idea that white people are attacking you, that society in the affirmative action era is hostile to you, more hostile than you are to society. And I, I'm, I'm rambling here a bit, but the same pattern exists in just many areas. I mean, when you're you're making the argument that the most hostile group to gay communities must be white straight males you know fraternity men or something like that the dominant group in society no it's not statistically like we we know this in, in order it's muslim men and orthodox jews then black men we keep this data every single year and note by the way that muslim men and orthodox jewish men like all these groups are right neck and neck with one another it's not one group but the mainstream white males were actually one of the least hostile groups to gay people um, that's a community where many people have been able to openly come out to kind of their bro circle, if you will, as gay. And that hostility has dramatically declined. I think that's a great, almost beautiful thing in some cases. So what you're seeing is a theory that's failed over and over and over again, but that's accepted whether you're talking about the Marxist class incarnation or the race incarnation that's become accepted almost in religious form in a lot of our academic institutions, so that's still very, very influential. It's impossible to get through university in the US or UK without reading the Communist Manifesto a few times, The Bridge is My Back on the Feminist Side, Delgado, Ibram Kendi. So everyone kind of has this as a baseline, and you, you get used to these ideas. You incorporate them without even thinking about them. And I'll close with one final thing. One of the root ideas here is this concept. And these ideas, coalition of the fringes, even the phrase great replacement, although I don't use it in my writing, these aren't radical GOP ideas. These are things people were saying that were consultants that I would debate with for the other party six or seven years ago. Uh, Ray Teixeira wrote a book called The Emerging Democratic Majority. But um, the, the idea of the coalition of the fringes was very specifically a, a strategic idea that underpinned this. And sort of the plan was, well, we on the Democratic side, and like I said, I think there's just as much of a problem on the GOP side, and the Republicans just ignored this. But the idea on the Democratic side was, well, we've got all these groups that don't much like each other. What do feminists have in common with uh, autogynophilic males, for example? What do uh, union laborers and hardworking illegal immigrants have in common? What do black people and recently arrived Islamic immigrants, two groups that historically have fought legendary wars against each other, if you read anything in history, what, what do they have in common? And the answer was what they have in common is a dislike for the blonde and the blue blazer, like their hereditary enemy. And all these people can unify at least to the point where they beat him. That was, that was the idea. And I think what we're seeing now is as the data comes out, that coalition is fracturing a little bit. People are beginning to understand that the things you'd predict if the theory underlying it was true are not happening, one. And I think also you're seeing just that these groups do not like each other to an extent where keeping them together is difficult. So right now, I mean, you're seeing uh, the TERFs, kind of the strong feminist women versus trans population across social media and face to face. You're also yesterday, and I guess I'll close with this, you're seeing black Americans versus Palestinians right now, where people, and I actually, I'm kind of with the Palestinians on this one. Palestinian advocates are saying, you know, we're involved in this bloody war. And if you're on our side, you know, you should, you should back us because we're at war. Um, and black Americans are saying things like, what has Palestine ever done for us? So it's, it's difficult to comprehend how the, those two factions could stay together, but they're apparently planning to meet up in person at the DNC, if you're talking about the, the larger groups there. So we might, we might really see something special. And that would be a microcosm for U.S. politics and Western politics in general, I suspect.
Thanks, Wilfred. Uh, very entertaining and frank as usual. Um, thank, uh, thank you for joining us, uh, late as it may have been. Um, I was tempted to segue by, by, by way of making a joke about fraternities, but then you set me up better <laughs> by mentioning autogynophilic males. Um, Phil uh, can talk about some of the fracturing uh, between the trans community and, uh, and feminists, um, and because Phil doesn't even identify as a, a trans woman, but um, just as a man who wears a dress, and yet, nevertheless, he was still pilloried by by radical neo Marxist feminists who think that uh, that as a man he must be part of the evil patriarchy. So, um, yeah, Phil's written two great pieces for us. One was basically a summary of his 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 wonderful book, The Forbidden Knowledge of Auto Heterosexuality. That's the name of the the article at QM, not not of his book. Uh, and a more recent one, I blew up the internet by wearing a dress to a gender conference. So, um, uh, Phil, can you uh, can you speak about that? Yeah. Um, so, yeah, regarding that first piece I wrote about the forbidden knowledge of auto heterosexuality, um, I I'm doing what I'm doing because right now the people that have this sort of um, internalized heterosexuality. Um, which is um, uh, in males is called autogynophilia, means love of self as woman, and in females it's called autoandrophilia, which is love of self as man. Um, the people that have this sort of directionally inverted heterosexuality, they're not being told the truth about just a that their orientation even exists, and then b that you know it. It's important to know about this because it, it causes gender dysphoria in a decent subset of this population. And uh, part of, as part of my learning process for learning about autogynophilia and related matters, I really came to appreciate liberalism because of its knowledge production process by by believing that objective truth exists, that, that there's some objective reality out there that we can um, appeal to, and that by using reason and arguments to arrive at knowledge that corresponds to that objective reality, um, it seems to lead to a unprecedented human flourishing. And so I wanted to, so I'm a, I'm a big fan of Queer Majority for its, um, for what you guys do with promoting liberalism. It's really important, especially because the, the critical social justice is way more fashionable among sexual minorities right now. Um, even though liberalism is what has gotten them tangible rights. And so I, I wrote about auto heterosexuality because the people that have this orientation deserve to be told what it is to be treated as adults. Like if if we're as a society okay with letting people that have gender dysphoria undergo medical interventions, which are quite serious, then at the very least, we should be able to treat the people seeking these interventions in an adult-like manner in the sense of telling them the truth about where their dysphoria comes from. And so, yeah, I, I wrote um, my book because I, I think my kind just deserve, they deserve to have a fair shot at interpreting their experiences and being able to sort of just grasp what's going on and not be confused about it anymore and not be ashamed. Um, and, you know, as, as you mentioned, Rio, um, I got that I experienced my first Twitter mob um, last fall from feminists um, who were mad at me for wearing a dress to a gender conference. Um, and this, it's seems weird on the face of it because you would think feminists of all people would be absolutely ecstatic that there's men wearing dresses, you know, for, for equality and, and all that. Um, but the, the sort of Marxist radical feminists that whose ideology has heavily influenced, um, the type of people that were the haters in that Twitter mobbing, they they just see men as oppressors and they've also demonized autogynophilia amongst themselves and portrayed it as something that 
that autogynephilia is basically like when men try to push women's boundaries for a sexual thrill is, is sort of how they portray it. Um, and so they just simply seeing the fact that I was identifying as autogynephilic and that I was at a conference that was put together to combat the gender identity ideology. Um, they saw me as, I guess, a uh, fox in the hen house or whatever metaphor that um, as a threat that must be removed. And that led to a lot of infighting between different between the liberal feminists and and the radical feminists. And in, in the end, to, to no one's surprise here, the liberal feminists remained liberal. And the radical feminists just got more radical. And I, I think that sort of um, controversy saga or whatever, just it, it kind of shows the strength of liberalism that people that think that use the philosoph philosophical framework of liberalism, that they're much more capable of having reasoned, calm conversations and of just being moderate. And I, I think in, in the political times we're in now where everyone is getting more extreme and, and radicalized, I think um, if liberalism became cool again, like it used to be, um, then it could bring down the temperature on a lot of the really intense um, cultural infighting that we're having. That's beautifully said, Phil. appreciate that. Um, and. Boy, you guys are making my job so easy. You just set me up perfectly for the first question uh, to the to the whole group, uh, including including Jen. You know, because of course you have a lot to say about liberalism, uh, running the Institute of Liberal Values as you do. Um, but yeah, Phil, you mentioned uh, the radical feminists become more radical and the liberals stayed liberal. I want to set aside the liberals saying liberal part because I think there is a problem of a lot of liberals failing to recognize the threat from the illiberal left. Um, but I do think that you're right in that when it's actually applied correctly, liberals are much more open to conversation because we actually really are pluralistic. We really do believe in free speech. We really do believe in democracy and compromise and all those wonderful things, coexistence and integration as opposed to dismantling things and tearing them down. But something else that stood out to me was you talked about how the radicals became more radical in the context of them essentially being sex negative prudes, frankly, right? Like how dare somebody who they who had something they regarded as a fetish because it's a, you know, it's kind of a paraphilia, I suppose, right? I mean, we all have them, um, but like, how dare somebody who has such a thing, you know, be in public? I mean, it's not like you're walking around doing sex acts or something, you're just wearing a dress. So how would nobody, nobody would even know if you're, it, 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 it's not like you're walking around with a raging heart on all the time or something. So it's a deeply sex negative attitude and that ties in nicely with um, with something else. Uh, well, it, it ties in nicely with what what Will wrote about for us, which is this this weird kind of combination of of um, like prudishness on like the far right and prudishness on the far left, and the horseshoe kind of meets in this whole like sex negative anti liberal space. So I don't know, Will, if you want to jump in there, or anybody else who wants to rip on what I just said. I thought this when the um the whole controversy first took off. And actually, Phil and I said this in a couple conversations online because this was a whole thing that went on on Twitter and other social media platforms for days. And I initially thought it was a joke to some extent. Um, uh, hundreds of people were commenting about things like, I was exposed to his clothing without consent. And I, I actually really think, obviously, I mean, the first time you have sex on a date or something, of course, get consent, ask, make sure they're happy. But like, you don't need consent for everything you do in life. If your, your wife slaps you on the ass, she doesn't have to ask you for consent. You don't you don't need can, people's consent for to wear gray sweatpants outside. People aren't constantly walking around with lawyers or stenography pads in their backpack. And this this struck me as a classic example of that. You don't. And I mean, I, I have a bantering style, but you don't need 
the constant approval of others for your your mode of dress and so on it seemed utterly insane and i think that far more than even the the bros on the far right who often tend to be sort of libertarian hunters and fishermen for all the christian stuff the act an actual government led by say radical feminists would massively restrict almost every sort of normal behavior you'd be returning to chaperonage and so on a lot of this actually strikes me as a backlash to the negative impact on women of the removal of those sort of three date norms that existed for almost all of modern post 1900 life that early feminism did so much to get rid of. But that's another story, uh, perhaps a chapter in an upcoming book anyway. Um, but so for, for days, this went on with people attacking Phil, who, again, as you mentioned, war addressed to a gender conference that involved a fair amount of alcohol consumption where nobody objected to it, where people were taking pictures with him and so on. So the initial reaction was that this seemed a bit crazy, but the idea that this is um, tied into a, a, a mild paraphilia and thus you did need that level, that additional level of public approval, that seems like something that you can't possibly verify when it comes to other people's clothing. Like, it's very easily possible to imagine a dozen styles of dress that would sexually arouse people. Like, it, if you've had an interesting life at all, you very frequently notice that people are walking around wearing their sub collar or their choker or something like that in public streets. You're not going to come up to them and say, you know, I understand why you have that on. I am disturbed. Would you mind taking it off? Um, you're not going to stop women in sundresses and mention that you notice they're not wearing underwear. I imagine you'd be struck in the face several times daily if you were to do this. I'm uncomfortable as a Christian or Muslim man. Could you please, ma'am, dress yourself properly? I, I assume you may be enjoying this. The, uh, the idea of talking to strangers about the idea that their clothing might be arousing them or might be arousing you is extremely unusual and itself not uh, gentlemanly or ladylike in the usual sense. So I don't know. I, I found the conversation basically bizarre. Um, I don't know. I, I'd actually be interested. I, I assume Phil is going to phrase his response tactfully, but I don't think that if you are autogynophilic as a personal taste, you are walking around massively aroused all the time. But the idea that you find a certain style of dress somewhat titillating, like you go out on a date and your date is wearing a short skirt and you have a business suit on, people generally find that attractive, to say the least. That doesn't mean that you need to check whether that's okay with other people in your dinner party. That's kind of how I viewed this. But I mean, Phil, what do you, what do you think? Do you, do you feel so, so turned on by your, your style of dress that you should check it with other people? What's, what's your, uh, what's your attitude there? Um, I don't really, it's just what I prefer to wear at this point. Um, it, it doesn't cause any noticeable arousal. It's just my regular clothes. And I, mean, I, I, I could tell. Huh? I'm, I'm teasing you a little bit, but I said, I mean, I assumed I could probably tell. It's a tight blue right. dress. Oh, right. Yeah, yeah. No, I mean, not if I was... I no, I'm trying best to tricks, so you can't tell. But, um... Tie it down or something. Yeah, right. just layering. Um, okay. But, um... Yeah, I... I don't feel the need to ask consent from all of society to wear a dress. Um, Cause as far as I'm concerned, if I'm covering up enough of my body, you know, um, I don't think it matters what sort of gender signifiers might be accompany various garments based on their, their cut and shape and material and so forth. Um, yeah, that, that whole controversy I think was really quite silly and um it it really it was clearly hard for the organizers of the conference to have put together all that intentional programming and then just have it completely overrun by extremism sort of on their side by extremism nonetheless that's a really good point because by by um you know and it is silly but it's nevertheless illustrative of a problem of an anti-liberal authoritarian tendency on the far left right but um, by doing that, and, and leftist tactics often are this counterproductive in this way, 
by doing that, these radical feminists were actually distracting people from from the the gender uh, critical message that was coming out of that conference that presumably they wanted people to hear. Right. This happens so often where people do things. You know, you see it with like the BLM and Tifa riots on the far left. Most of those people don't actually vote Democrat, by the way. They most of them hate the Democratic Party. But then, um, you know, on the on the right, you see, you know, like uh, people making excuses for the January 6th riots. It's, and and here we are, normal liberals in the middle, and we're like, hey, you guys, you know, political violence, for borderline terrorism is bad, and it should be a nonpartisan position to say that. Um, Maybe uh, uh, Jimmy or, or or somebody else wants to speak about that, given what's going on in the in the UK right now. I'm sure you've given a lot of thought to that, haven't you? Um, actually, I don't want to speak about that. It was something <laughs> I wanted. I fair wanted enough, to wanted to something. I think it was first of all, it's really nice to sit with people who've got a sense of humor, who are able to kind of talk about these topics. So often, when these dialogues are happening, I find myself in spaces where I'm like, okay, where is the next eggshell that I need to make sure I'm not stepping on, and I'm tiptoeing around with like you know, just just being sensitive of everybody there. So it's, you know, it's heartening to kind of be in this space where we can laugh. Uh, and, and I think some of what we're situated in is pretty laughable, actually. Uh, somebody mentioned the word religion earlier. I think it might have been Will. And, you know, when you're working in an, uh, an ex-Muslim arena, like the synergies between, you know, this kind of really far left, what, what feels like a religious indo indoctrination where like when you are situated in Islam, you know, there, there's massive contradictions like, oh, uh, Muhammad was the first person who gave women rights um, in that part of the world. Yeah, but also in the Quran, verse 434 says you can beat your wife, you know, so, you know, this kind of contradiction and actually, but actually what you can do to um, sex slaves when you capture them who are women, you know, like, the, the idea that, that Islam was this universal human rights doctrine and women were somehow emancipated by it when it came along and are still emancipated. There might be some argument that it actually uh, improved property rights for them and uh, limited the number of uh, women that a man could take as, as wives. But the idea that that is where it should stop and it shouldn't have progressed to a point where, you know, beating your wife was outlawed perhaps. You know, it's just kind of um, something you're not supposed to say, certainly not supposed to question something like there's a man in the sky who loves you so much that if you fail the test you didn't sign up for, you're going to be burnt for all eternity and tortured with no end date in sight. You know, pointing out these kind of contradictions you're just not allowed to do. And it reminds me of um, one of the Pride March we went on uh, as the Council of Ex-Muslims of Britain. And a lot of our uh, people that we work with or, or, or who join our support groups um, are individuals who are refugees. And apostasy, you know, like if you're persecuted for leaving your religion, it grants refugee status and you can be resettled in the UK. So a lot of a lot of people uh, who, who, who come to our support groups are kind of apostate refugees. And the year before that, we had marched um, in, in Gay Pride and there had been a huge controversy that people were walking around with signs saying, make love, not Sharia, uh, that sort of thing, right? We were like, um, uh, uh, more orgasms, less Islam. Like we were, we, we were marching around with these kind of signs that were quite tongue in cheek and it caused such a huge issue that we were banned or rather we were under, under investigation for eight months before we were granted the right to uh, march again. And you have to think about how insane and pernicious that is that, that pride, which is the bastion of challenging religious homophobia, that a group that were challenging religious homophobia were told, sorry, you're suspended from being able to march next year until we conduct an investigation into you, right? But then the following year, when we did get to march again, I remember that there was uh, two people who were standing there with signs saying refugees welcome. And so I saw this sign and I was like with my best mate who's an apostate refugee and we kind of ran up to them. We're like, hi, oh my God, love your sign. Give us a hug, give us a hug. So they gave us a hug and they were like, what group are you with? And we're like, oh, we're the Council of Ex-Muslims of Britain. And they were like, go away. <laughs> Just get away with it. Just get away from us. And we were like, but I don't understand what's happened. Like, you've got a sign saying refugees welcome. And they were like, no, just get away because, you know, you guys are anti-Muslim bigots. And it was like, you cannot see that you're literally holding a sign 
that kind of welcomes people who are apostates and who challenge Islam. But to kind of draw your attention to this contradiction is it's just like when you're situated in religion, the cognitive dissonance is just reconciled through a complete disregard for the dialogue and a disregard for the any analysis. It's like, actually, you know, Islam is perfect and this is how we've got to get on. Similarly, uh, refugees are welcome. You refugees, <laughs> go stand over there. We don't want you anywhere near us, but there's no conflict in my sign and what I believe and what's actually going on in front of my face. The well, empirical yeah. reality has to be denied. Presumably they're, 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 they're fleeing Islamic countries because of the oppression that they face there. But that the irony couldn't be more direct, and yet they didn't see it at all. Yeah, they didn't uh, see it ben, at all. Ben, did you, is that, does that speak to your experience in um, CSJ uh, Ivy League circles? Yeah. Is it, is, it, is it basically a secular religion, like Jimmy said? Well, yeah. And also, my, like, what I ended up writing about in terms of my book had you know, so much more to do with, honestly, with like Islam and the intersection of leftism and Islam um, than I had planned because, or, you know, that would have, would have initially thought just because it's so entrenched in, uh, in progressive Ivy League academia. Anyway, I mean, as we've seen, especially over the past year, everybody's, um, become more privy to it. None of what's occurred since October 7th has surprised me even a little bit. None of it has shocked me. The encampments, the testimonies, you know, everything that's gone on, the reaction, you know, the, the pro-Palestine protests on October 8th, you know, and October 9th. And, um, you know, nothing su surprised me because of what I saw um, for myself on, on campus. And, you know, like I, and in terms of yeah, having a religious aspect, I mean, that's kind of essentially like what my, what I write about as well in my book is when I entered that space, you know, like I had grown up in religious fundamentalism. So I was really primed for wanting to be like righteous and virtuous. And I had fallen out of this and been excommunicated from the community that I had grown up in. And of course I was gay. And so I was, a you know, a, a, a and a, a heretic or a, a, a sinner in that respect. But then I kind of found this new community in which that was, allowed me to be virtuous. I was one of the good guys again. Um, and it was exhilarating, you know, and it felt exciting because it soothed that perpetual shame and guilt that I had of being a bad person. Um, but then I realized that within this world, there's no there's no grace there's no mercy there's no forgiveness um there's no chance at redemption especially if you're a cis white male um but even a cis white gay but specifically that that you are you that the, for the rest of your life you will be doing the work you will be repenting and apologizing and there is no end game um and but yeah, I mean, when I entered the space, when I got to Columbia, this was, you know, Trump was inaugurated the first week that I was there. So I'm part of, you know, raring to be part of this hashtag, you know, resistance and, um, you know, I'm protesting with, with you know, the, the, the pro-Muslim groups at Alma Mater and, and they're having like afternoon community afternoon prayers where everybody can participate. Um, you know, and we're all bowing towards Mecca and, you know, introducing, you know, and, but, but for, but then very quickly, I thought, wait, what am I, what am I getting involved in here? What, what's going on? Like, what, how did I end up here? You know? Um, and so I really started looking at that in my research from the get go. And I started looking at really the similarities between, honestly, between right wing and Christian extremism and Islamism and looking at all these parallels. And once I started researching and looking at the work that American evangelicals have done abroad to you know, criminalize homosexuality in developing nations and how that directly intersects with, with, uh, with the criminalization of homosexuality by in, in, in Muslim majority countries and how it's kind of a, almost in some cases a contest to out anti-gay the other to attract more converts to the religion. Um, because, you know, gay and, you know, this idea of the gay international is, 
you know, a, 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 an example of Western encroachment and, and imperialism and human rights imperialism and, and the West really, you know, putting its own conceptions of sexuality and gender on uh, uh, other uh, nations and regions and cultures. So once I started kind of really delving into that and seeing where all of these things intersected, I was like, everybody's just so full of shit. And I, um, yeah. And so I was suddenly an outsider. Um, and, and it was, it, it, and it is illiberal. Um, but, you know, I mean, like I would see, and then I would go online and I would see people like serious thinkers say like, you know, oh, when you say anything bad about identity politics, that's, you know, critiquing identity, poli identity politics is white supremacy. Like that's, you know, that's, that's white supremacy and repeat it until it sinks in. That was a tweet that really stuck in my, it was like, repeat this until it sinks in, you know, crit crit criticizing identity politics is white supremacy. First of all, I'm like, okay, what kind of crazy, you know, repeat that until it sinks in. Okay. Like mantras and chanting. And I mean, it just, it, those, those repetitions of like, you know, is, is just beyond. Um, you know, of course, 2020 seeing like white people washing black people's feet and like the baptisms at George Floyd Square and all of these things. I mean, I, again, it didn't surprise me at all because I had existed in this milieu, but it was just, there are so many parallels there. But with, with identity politics specifically, what's been hard for me, what's, it, what's taken a lot of reckoning and, and really kind of trying to humble myself in a lot of ways is because I was significantly part of the problem. I mean, I was, um, you know, I was very, I was simply parroting what, what, what so many talking points that, that were just handed down to me. And I wasn't really looking at these issues for myself, you know, left guys, good, right, bad, you know? Um, I mean, I had a, you know, and so, separating identity politics from that is that I wonder if like, you know, is, can identity politics really actually gel with liberalism? Like, can it, can they coexist because um, of what it takes away from looking at people as individuals and in terms of what we have in common and, and reaching across difference and rather, and instead puts people and divides people into their specific groups. But I'll tell you, with being in academia and being in those worlds, the most disturbing thing for me was the way that I was expected to view people of other races, which felt intrinsically immoral to me. It just completely felt disgusting. And so to see entire groups of people to paint them as monoliths and as oppressed and is and it, it was almost like which was weird was that learning so much about the idea of orientalism and post-colonialism and like edward said's theory of like othering you know uh black and brown people and 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 but then to kind of like maintain this ideology that was othering like there was almost like treating black and brown people as like exotic mystical figures you know it was it was it, it being closer to the truth by virtue of their skin color um it the way that that occurred and i was i know i wasn't the only one that saw this and i know i wasn't not just the only white person i mean black and brown people who i was friends with were like what the fuck is this um it was repulsive to me and that's a hill I'll die on. And I don't care, um, you know, because uh, the way that race has been perverted and how stupid people are about it is, 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 is it's, it's insulting to our collective intelligence as liberal Americans, especially um, the way that people weaponize that and, 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 so fundamentally are backwards in terms of being so regressive and thinking that that brand of anti-racism will do anything besides perpetuate more racial divide is beyond me. So you're muted, Rio. 
Uh, <laughs> I was so engrossed in what you were saying, I failed to notice that I hadn't turned turned my uh, microphone back on. Uh, thanks for that. Yeah, I, um, I, correct me if I'm wrong, Jen, but I think it might be time to start inviting some some questions. Do you do you want to yes. um, tell people how that works, and then and then I'm going to ask about a liberal approach to identity politics is the first question to buy them time to, to submit some. We, we've got one question already, if you want me to start there or if we want to oh, go. Well, actually, questions. in that case, can you just tell, just tell them how to submit questions again? Remind them some people joined later and, and, then, and right. then we'll do the identity politics question and then you can take it from there. So I'll moderate some of these questions coming through and I actually have a few of my own as well. So we do have one question from our audience that has come through it. The question is, and, and actually, okay, now we have more than one. <laughs> so, so, so sorry, Jim. I, I'm sorry. All, I, I'm sorry. Go ahead. I, I meant to just ask you to to tell them how to submit the questions because a lot oh, of folks yes. were here earlier. And so then the people we'll, I'll ask one question and then you can ask a billion. <laughs> perfect, perfect, okay. perfect. So for our people in the audience, there's a little chat box. So type in your questions there and Rio and I will take it from the, take it from there. So I will start Rio with Elizabeth's question. Some research suggests that in-group perspective taking can lead to negative intergroup outcomes when the exercise reveals that there is in-group diversity. High in-group identifiers seem to be especially vulnerable to the manipulation and to the retributive, sorry, I can't speak, retributive responses to non-conformists. Do you think that it is possible that progressives focus on empathetic perspective taking has led to the kind of negative outcomes you've been describing or is empathetic perspective taking part of what it means to be liberal? Well, I, I mean, I, I feel like Will would be super qualified to speak about the possible misfirings of empathy. <laughs> I'd love to hear you say something about that. Or were you talking to me? Yes, yes. Sorry, uh, Will. Um, yeah, I was just thinking about uh, the possible misfirings of empathy. Seems like no. that was, you know, a, a softball thrown your way. Oh, okay. I, I wasn't. I mean, I, I don't think any of us is a, an evil person or anything. But there, we have five guys on the panel. I don't know if any of us are you know, psychologists who specialize in empathy. I mean, um, but you know, I I have actually uh, gotten some notice for a couple of articles looking at some of the negative downstream impacts of excessive empathy. Rio, could could you repeat what what you asked me there? Sorry. Or I, I um, maybe Jen could repeat the question. Would that, okay. would that be good? Okay. Sure. Yeah. Yeah. Sorry. Yeah. So the question is, do you think it is possible that progressives focus on empathetic perspective taking has led to the kind of negative outcomes you've been describing or is empathetic perspective taking part of what it means to be liberal? Oh, OK. No. Part of what means to be liberal. No, I don't really think empathetic perspective taking is part of what it means to be liberal it, it, beyond empathetic perspective taking being part of what it means to be human. I, I think that we all try to avoid callous cruelty. Uh, I mean, if I had to describe pure evil, it would be hurting non competitors, not in self defense for no gain, kicking puppies or babies or something like that. I think we all view that as despicable behavior. And this is true whether or not there's any sort of ultimate morality. I mean, I tend to think there's not, but there's still no reason to do things that are disgusting to both of those around you and that are you know, unworthy of an honorable warrior or a businessman for no reason. You know? um, but that's, the, I think if I were to describe the key principle of traditional liberalism, it's the idea that there's an objective reality and we have the ability and almost the duty to study it. And we want the results of our analysis, I think, in, in our inner self to be things that correspond with what we think of as the good and the bright and the beautiful. We, we kind of have a, a duty, a higher duty to follow what the actual truth is. So I actually think that excessive, oh, this I think is actually a serious point here, excessive empathy is a barrier to the pursuit of truth that is at the root of real science and at the root of objectivism-based liberalism. So, I mean, for example, if we find that diversity in general is a mild good for society, simply having people that look somewhat different and that make different cuisines, but multiculturalism is a huge negative for societies. 
actually having people that identify with different tribal flags and refuse to stop speaking different languages in political science is the biggest predictor of civil war. It's not disputed. This goes back to Horowitz, 2000, ethnic groups in conflict. It's just something we know. Most of you have probably read this book in college. So if we find this, if someone keeps saying, well, we have asylum seekers coming to our country, we must let them in because we can't let a young man die. It's important that someone step forward and say, no, that's not true. We value humans, but we value our humans a bit more than these other humans. So we're going to seal the border or at least establish some kind of formal process because we know this thing. We know this fact. We won't pretend this objective fact is not real. So, no, I, I think the core idea of liberalism is that we can find objective reality. And while we try to be kind, I'm sure all of us tithe to charity or in our religious institutions, we have them. That's that cannot be the top priority in society. Tithing or diversity, something we probably enjoy in dating or something like that, can't be the number one priority in society over objectivism or functionality. So, no, I don't actually think empathy is the top priority of liberalism. I think it would be number nine or something like that, a nice addition. Yeah, I don't know if they, they, they intended it for it to be the top one. Um, I, I, I follow what you're saying there, there Will, and I, I would like to open it up for anybody else to, to comment on. But something that occurred to me is I think multiculturalism, maybe this is just making a semantic clarification, right? Some of us, when we think of multiculturalism, we think of like, oh, there's different fashion styles, there's different cuisines. I think that kind of multiculturalism is uh, largely a good for society. But I, I take your point to mean that essentially if people fail to integrate into our liberal culture and they fail to, for example, um, value our basic fundamental values like free speech and uh, freedom of religion and, um, you know, uh, uh, you, you can't rape women just because they're dressed a certain way, et cetera, right? Like, th th that's bad uh, when people fail to integrate. Is that what you're saying or, or are you saying something a little bit even deeper than that? Yeah, I, I think that the standard. So, I mean, that most of us are professionals in one field or another. I think in political science and, you know, ap apologies to David H. if I misquote him. But I think like the Horowitz definition of diversity would just be, you know, members of different races and ethnic groups in the same society, men and women, both liberated people keep their traditional food and all that. Um, multiculturalism is the existence of different tribes. So actually different languages, different flags as a common signifier, different, um, understand, different understandings of the law, I think is the one based on my legal background and quant background that most, most resonates with me. And that actually, that doesn't work. So like at a certain level, I think we'd all recognize that British society, UAE society, South Indian society, and Norwegian society are all highly civilized in their way. But if you took 25% individuals from each of those societies and put them in one country, that's not going to be a very functional country. I mean, so that that's multiculturalism. And say 25% Peruvians, British and Norwegian people are too similar. That's too much of a majority. They take power. But I mean, that, that's not going to be a very functional country, and we need to acknowledge that. Well, I mean, I, I don't know if Jimmy wants to talk about this, but in um, the UK, um, they actually even have, you know, like publicly funded faith schools where public where where tax dollars are used to educate students in different religious traditions. I think that the way we do it in the U.S. is is a bit better. And um, it's it's because we you, we say, hey, you can teach your kids whatever you want at home. But if it's being funded by the tax dollars, we're going to have a secular liberal approach to education um, and uh, uh, throwing out another idea out there. Um, uh, we, we also have, um, you know, a, a problem with this kind of secular religion of critical social justice um, coming into the public schools, and, and that's happening in the U.S. as well, because it's not really seen as a religion, uh, even though critical pedag pedagogy has Catholic socialist roots. Uh, but yeah, I, I think I think that I take Will's broader point is basically we have to have some shared conception as Americans if we're in the U.S. in order to maintain a national identity, and you can you can do that and still have sombreros and tacos and all that awesome stuff. Uh, you know, you just you just can't say. I, I, my Mexican identity is more important to me than my American identity. That could that would be very bad for society indeed. Any any comments on that on on CSJ or should we move on to another question from Jen? 
That's a question for everybody in general. Can I just add to what you said? Like beyond the faith schools as well, like in the UK, we have Sharia courts, you know, so that's even more insane, in my opinion. So you might have, um, it's just essentially a parallel legal system and how it can really impact people is, uh, so we have a, kind of this idea of Islamic marriage, you know, like you have the religious marriage and the, in religious communities that can be seen as far more important than uh, going down to the courthouse and having your civil marriage uh, registered in law, right? But of course, the latter gives you a whole host of rights as a woman, um, and the former doesn't give you a whole host of rights as a woman, but does give you a whole host of rights if you're a man, yeah? Uh, in terms of an inequitable distribution of rights between the couple. And so then what you find is actually that, you know, four or five years down the line or however long, when the couple want to separate, there's been no legal recognition of the marriage uh, within the UK in terms of it being a, a, a registered marriage. And all of the rights that that woman would have been afforded were she to get a divorce are just non-existent because what she had was a, uh, a religious wedding, sorry, a religious uh, marriage. And then even more pernicious, there can be a drive for that because you know, the patriarchy will do what the patriarchy has got to do. And when I mean the patriarchy, I mean like real patriarchy, right? Like, so it's going to do what it's going to do, which is actually encourage males to have these kind of weddings where uh, they don't actually have to stand in front of the law and be accountable for what they would do were the marriage registered in that legal way. Yeah, thanks for bringing up the courts. Uh, I, I realized I should have mentioned that. But, uh, Jen, do um, you want to ask another one? Yeah, we've got another question. Hi, Am uh, Amania and Ian are here with us. So thank you all for joining. So Amania asks, thanks for your many great points of view. I myself come from Samoa where people like me are known as, and I may mispronounce this, fa 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 fin, which means in the manner of woman and socially accepted as long as we fulfill traditional female social duties, cooking, caring for children and older people, et cetera. In the West, we'd call we'd we'd be called trans and lumped in with many different kinds of trans people. Have any of you thought about traditional cultural identities around gender nonconformity and how they fit or not, and could be helpful or not with the Western construct of transgender dysphoria? Okay, so I figure I'll I'll take a stab at this one. Um, different. In the West, there, there's two different types of male to female transgenderism. There's the autogynophilic type, which accounts for at least 80% of male to female transsexuals in the West. Um, and the remaining ones are what are called homosexual transsexuals, which are um, boys, basically boys that are just effusively effeminate, that people could just tell from a very young age that that boy is going to grow up to be gay, or at least in the West, people might have that thought. But um, so different cultures historically with with this type of the homosexual male to female transgenderism different cultures have come up with different cultural solutions to this like because they have to incorporate very feminine androphilic males into society and so quite a few cultures have come up with quote unquote third gender categories and um in, in samoa the fafafina are um an example of that where um basically people can tell that from a young age they're like oh this 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 child is a fafafina and then they just get raised as a girl and um that works for a lot of them because with with homosexuality there tends to be a sort of a cross-gender shift in psychological traits that are associated with the the other sex's mating strategy um you know it's it's mostly women that are attracted to men you know like the female reproductive strategy involves attracting to men and there's a bunch of different psychological traits that come along with that as part of that reproduction strategy and so yeah the the fafafina are um probably primarily um comparable to the the homosexual type of transgenderism in the west and um, th this type of transgenderism is kind of the classical idea that in the West, like people think of that as sort of stereotypical transgenderism, even though nowadays it's not the majority. It, it's people can just intuitively 
they they get it when they when they see a, a homosexual male to female transsexual they just that that passes well and effortlessly they're just like yeah that's obviously someone that should live as a woman they just like intuitively get it and so yeah i i think i hopefully some of what i said sort of um answers your question about um the relation between traditional cultural identities and, and gender nonconformity and then how that compares to the west thanks phil could you say a bit more about your own personal background and and your studies and so forth and 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 how you came to that understanding yeah um so around uh about five years ago i learned about the concept of autogynophilia and then I got really obsessed with learning about it because it blew my mind that I had this form of sexuality that I had not been able to put a name to and that apparently lots of people experience. And yet I was like, why didn't anyone tell me about this? And so th this two type idea of, of transsexualism is it originates with um, a researcher named Ray Blanchard. Um, he's a researcher based in Toronto and he did a, a research program building on previous research, say by Hirschfeld and Harry Benjamin and, and others, he conducted a series of studies which found that male to female transsexuals who were asexual, bisexual, or heterosexual with respect to their birth sex reported, um, the great majority of them reported past arousal from cross-dressing or from um, fantasizing about themselves as women. Whereas the the male and female transsexuals who um, only reported attraction to men, very few of them reported past arousal from either cross-dressing or the thought of themselves as women. And he deduced from these differences and, and others, um, I'm keeping it brief for the sake of time, he deduced that there's two fundamentally different types of transgenderism in, in males. One that is caught a byproduct of gender non-conforming homosexuality and the other one that is caused by a type of internalized heterosexuality is basically just heterosexuality that's just like pointed at yourself and which he called autogynophilia. And his research, his findings that there's drastically different rates of prior arousal from cross-dressing and cross-gender cross -gender fantasy, that that finding has been replicated by other groups of researchers. Thanks, Phil. Um, <clears throat> okay, we're, we're, we're coming up on 90 minutes, which is how long I told everybody that we would be, uh, um, we'd be doing this. So maybe we should start wrapping up. If anybody has any final questions they want to ask, please get them in in the next few minutes. And uh, uh, Jin, can you uh, say a bit more about ILD and uh, its partnership with QM um, and uh, what, we're, what we're planning to do with these series going forward? Thanks. Absolutely. So first of all, I, I kind of want to tell a story, and I think that that will illustrate a little bit about ILV, about maybe me and about our relationship, Rio, queer majority and ILV. So when we first started to discuss this merging of, of QM or, you know, starting QILV, QM and, and ILV together, you know, there was a lot of, of backlash. And I think to me, that's what really uh, defined, if you will, my commitment to liberalism. So to the extent that I can be labeled, I really don't really like labeling, but some labels that I, I are just factual and that I would accept are Christian, cis, white, female, right? And given all those labels though, I really feel that liberalism is the only way that we can come together and have these discussions like the discussion that we're having now. And despite the, the backlash to you know, perhaps you know, partnering with a, a queer queer majority, and despite even being you know identifying as a Christian, where some people would say, well, you know, you can't be a Christian with with this. I really, really identify mostly as a liberal. And here's like my my own personal story. Even being faithful is, I think we should go back to this the old 1990s, at least in America, y'all. I don't know for you not being in America. Bumper sticker of what would Jesus do? Because I'm telling you what. He, he isn't happy. <laughs> you know, I don't know what he would say about certain trends, but what I do know was it was to love one another. And for me, and to love one another means to see the individuality and in everyone. And to me, that is the heart of liberalism. So I just, that's, that's where we are now. I will say ILV, we are, we are 
value viewpoint diversity, another very big liberal idea. And so not all everyone would tell the same story that I just told. But this is why, as a director, I've made the decisions that I've made to work with Rio, with you, with QM, and just really appreciating all of you and for the individuality and the, and the individualism that you bring to the table and to this discussion. Um, my, I want to do end, I think, on one big question, given the labels that I told you about me. One of the questions that I've heard before when I was telling people about our partnership and telling people about this panel and excuse my ignorance, um, but, you know, perhaps it's because of the labels, but what is, a lot of people ask me, well, what is queer? Everyone's, got, we've gotten up to the LGBT, right? And then we've added the QIA. But a lot of people say, well, what is queer? And, and Rio, I know kind of how you define it with queer majority. We're all a little queer, right? But define for us who are, are not part of this, this actual movement, but are liberals. What is, what does it mean to you or, or anyone on this panel to be queer? I mean, maybe we should each take a stab at that question. Um, I, I guess I'll go first since you mentioned me. Um, yeah, I, I, I think like a lot of words, queer has multiple meanings um, and that's fine. But uh, the way we use it at, at Queer Majority is we, we are basically trying to reclaim the term for liberalism because it's been so taken over by the critical social justice version of it, which is about dismantling normalcy and the entire concept of norms that I wanted to refocus it on its original, or it's at least its older meaning, which is basically just uh, strange, odd, or different. And I thought about the fact that everybody has something that deviates from the norm uh, a little bit here and there. You know, most of us are average in most ways, and including most LGBT people. We just deviate from the norm in a, in, in a certain way that society has decided is important or isn't or whatever. Um, and so it, it seems like actually a really good way of pushing back against the critical social justice narrative and the standpoint of epistemology, which says, you know, rather than testing things using the liberal enlightenment scientific method that Will and uh, Phil defended, we should just base it on who has the most depression points. A good way of pushing back against that is to say, actually, you know what, I'm not going to let you guys have this word queer. I'm going to reclaim that and say, uh, you know, there are actual norms in society. Um, we just all deviate from them from a little bit and uh, we should celebrate difference and individuality as long as we're not hurting anybody. Uh, and that's really where QM is coming from. But I'd love to hear what the rest of the panelists think. Um, I think I'll, I'll jump in next on this one. Um, as opposed to the sort of social and political version of queer that, that Rio just said, I, I personally define queer um, within sort of a psychology context of talking about sexual orientation. Um, I define it as sexual interests outside of external heterosexuality, sort of everything outside of women being attracted to men and men being attracted to women. Uh, every sexual interest outside of that is, is queer. And so that would include same sex attraction. That would include sort of internalized attraction to being different types of things. And that would also in include various forms of paraphilic behaviors, um, such as say like sadomasochism, for example. Um, basically, yeah, everything outside of attractions that are sort of evolutionarily viable in the sense of being directed towards normal looking adults um, is, is uh, queer. Uh, you know, I, I, I'll jump in too. I mean, we've talked about this, Rio. It's like, I have, you know, I, I'm totally down with like the queer majority vision of it. We're all a little bit weird, kind of reclaiming queer from the liberal left. Um, I bristle at it simply because of how in the spaces that I it was in academia, activism, it is or has become a politics. Um, and it is about not just, hey, we're all different um, and everybody's a little queer in, in certain ways and embracing that, that, li that liberal perspective. It's been about an anti-normative, an anti-cis heteronormativity of, um, of, of really dismantling that idea and where anything that goes against the norm is, it, yeah, it just breeds a new conformity. Um, but it, 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 you know, um, 
I I have an aversion to that. So like when Jen asks like, well, what is queer? And people ask about that. I personally think like the what what Rio's describing with queer majority is 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 a concept where it's we're trying to reclaim it. But for your you re, you know for people that are asking you, Jen, it really doesn't mean that. Unfortunately, for most people, when they're talking about LGBTQ, it doesn't mean that at all. It, it's actually tagging. It's 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 infusing hard left. Marxist progressive views and tagging them onto the LGBT, anybody who's lesbian, gay, bisexual, transgender. And it's in, and, and, and it, there's no separating that, unfortunately. So what I wish that it, you know, it was, it was something different. Unfortunately, it is like that. So I don't say I'm a part of the LGBTQ community. You know, I don't say that I'm I, because um, because of the way that that's understood now. Yeah, I, I should clarify too that that QM is intentionally being clever and using multiple meanings of the word queer and multiple meanings of the word majority, I suppose, or at least multiple applications of it. So another meaning of it is to say the majority of LGBT people are not Marxists, despite what they might be telling you. <laughs> Right, right. But that's a that's a little side point. I'm going to let what Ben st said stand otherwise. Um, and uh, uh, Wilfred or Jimmy, do either of you guys want to speak to that? Maybe not. OK, well, um, Jen, thank you so much for putting this together. Wait, hold on. Will was speaking. Oh, <laughs> he was okay. on mute. <laughs> OK, I'll wait. Yeah, I Okay, I think we're just going clockwise around the uh, around the, the virtual table. But um, so in terms of the sense of queer used by queer majority, I mean, I think what you mean and what I've always taken that to mean is sort of anyone that has, I, I don't know if I'd say paraphilia, but a quirky or kinky sexual taste, especially an LGBT one, which is the one time I looked this up, it was something like 92% of the population. I mean, I don't, I don't think you need to extend that to, you know, everyone who's a little bit weird or something like that. But I mean, there, there is that idea that most people are not just the bland, vanilla citizens that they appear to be in kind of public facing society. And that really is actually an interesting, useful idea. There, there are all these things that people will say, like we should ban pornography. That's something I brought up in the article I wrote for you guys that are difficult to disagree with in public for a certain kind of person, but that nobody actually wants to do. And I, I think that's an, I mean, 80% of guys watch porn. The figure is 87% for women if you throw in things like werewolf erotica. So, I mean, you know, I, I, you have to combine the two figures. It's a uh, visual and written for the ladies. But I mean, so I, I think that idea of the majority of people that are somewhat kinky or bisexual or something like that is a worthwhile one. I mean, I'm heterosexual in any uh, general sense of the term. So I, I don't know whether I'd be part of the queer majority in the, uh, the more conventional uh, usage, but I, I would be in, in that one. So I, I think that's that's what you're going for, mostly successfully. Yeah, thanks for clarifying that. It, it, can, it can come off as a little bit banal if it's just everybody's, you know, eccentric or whatever. Uh, we do tend to focus on the sex and relationships aspect of that yeah. the concept of queerness. Oh, uh, yeah, I mean, so I, I want to lead with saying I love queer majority. I know they've got about at least three different ex-Muslims that you've published articles with, and I'm so clear that very few people will touch our activism um, because it's just it's seen as too uh, contentious to even go near it. So whilst I love the publication, I never really utilize the word queer in describing myself. It's not something I'd ever go near. I just use the word gay. Uh, probably like Ben now, I don't really include myself within the gay community. But I think perhaps colloquially, in an era of LGBTQIA 2S++, you had to have another word that was quicker, uh, because no one's got that much time to work that into every sentence. And so people are now just using the word queer, which basically colloquially to me just means anybody who's not straight, which is kind of similar to what 
Bill was saying. So I, I, I wonder whether there's a correlation between this insane acronym that is just ever growing um, and then the introduction of this, you know, more streamlined uh, word that is positioned as reclaiming a, a gay slur. Well, Iona, who was going to be here but was sick, um, actually said that to me on the Quillette podcast when I went on and talked to her. She said, I'm just going to say queer because it takes too long to say all the letters. <laughs> and she's another another straight person like Will. So I, I, there's evidence for your thesis right there, Jenny. All right, uh, Jen, do you want to close this out or should I? I'm, I'm going to let you, I, but not before saying again, thank you. It's just been such a pleasure to have each one of you on here. So. Yes, thank you, you Jen. Will. It's an honor. And thank you for hosting this. And thank you for everything you guys do at the Institute for Liberal Values. Um, we're very proud to partner with you. Uh, we also partner with other great liberal orgs who are also trying to reclaim liberalism for actual liberal values, not the crazy far left nonsense. Uh, like I'm on, um, also on the advisory board of Project Liberal, which is a great new political action committee. It is actually nonpartisan. They're just supporting politicians with good classically liberal values um, or traditionally liberal or whatever you want to call it, which kind of goes really from center left to center right to Will's point. I mean, I would consider Will kind of a conservative liberal, if you would, um, in the sense that he still believes in democracy and free speech and a lot of things that maybe a theocratic monarchist might not, right? Um, but yeah, basically, I, I'll just close by saying, please, you know, follow the Institute for Liberal Values if you don't already, follow QM, follow Project Liberal, and uh, QM has a brand new community on, on um, X. I, I almost uh, um, called it Twitter and uh, uh, deadnamed it. Um, but uh, yeah, you can, follow, you can join our community on X and uh, speak to all of these, these great folks. Our computer, our, uh, except for Jimmy, who's not on Twitter, and I understand why. And I, I, sometimes I think about getting off for my own mental health. I completely get it. Uh, but yeah, um, you know, follow all these great, great folks, reach out to us and um, we'd love to, to hear from you and collaborate on, on this great mission. Can I just say that if you do want to follow anything to do with ex-Muslims, the Council of Ex-Muslims of Britain do have a Twitter. You can follow them. Uh, I think ex-Muslims of North America also have a Twitter. There's a few of our organizations out there that you can follow. I'll so put our... <laughs> I'll put the Twitter handles of everyone here in the YouTube video that we put out, as well as the articles we talked about today as well. And uh, we'll be putting this on, on QM's YouTube and promoting it on all of our social media. So it, it'll actually get seen by millions of people easily, <laughs> uh, which is which is a good thing because it was a great conversation. And it's so important for people to hear this. Sounds right. good. Thank you very much. Thank you. All right, thanks, guys. Thank you, guys. Thanks for having me. Yes. Oh